The Lord's peace be with you. I am Pastor Stephen Jurdy at Zion and Bethany Lutheran Churches. And I'm Pastor Joe Pinzel. And we are here for another issue of Table Talk, a time here on Tuesday mornings at 9 a.m. to discuss, basically, or hold an online uh, Bible study. And our topic for the last few weeks has been the splendor of the church based on Ephesians chapter 5, where we are told that Jesus Christ gives himself to the church so that he might present the church to himself, radiant and without blemish in splendor. And so what we've been talking about is what the church truly is, what the church also may be, because we have explored a little bit uh, that the church sometimes gets off track, right? The church sometimes stops, can become sort of, have sort of a spiritual amnesia where the church forgets what it really is here for, why it exists. And so the church starts doing things that it doesn't need to be doing uh, when in fact the church, church's life essentially is a life of receiving Jesus in order that we may be presented to Jesus. That is the radical life of the church to confess that we are receiving God and that we are then being given back to God and, uh, and to also confess that this radical exchange of, be, of receiving God and being given to God, receiving God in all of his innocence through Jesus Christ and being given to God in all of our sin through Jesus Christ is in fact the exchange that changes the world and that will ultimately and, and already has uh, redeemed the world through the precious blood of Christ. And now we're about the task of preaching that. So what, if, what are some things we have been going over here, Pastor Penzel? If you look over the last couple of weeks, what have we been talking about? What have been some of our emphases? Uh, where have we gone so far? Just to give a little brief summary to the people who are watching here. I think a particular emphasis that or emphasis that's always um, appealing to me and, and, and those of us here at Zion is the simplicity of the radical message mm. that you just presented. The simplicity is so elegant in that it's, it's very down to earth. It's very much attached to our way of living. It's, it's, it's so simple as a matter of fact that even it can be commended to a child. Um, you know, if you look at how children engage in their faith life through worship, they're never really inquiring why we're doing those certain things. They're just receiving them. And they're, as they're receiving them, they're learning themselves how to participate. Um, is, you know, I just think that yeah. that's a, a particularly beautiful part about maintaining that focus on Jesus, the reception of the gifts and the living and active good news that he is preaching upon us and conferring upon us, uh, and then also preserving that. As you talk about that, it makes me think of two things, uh, one from the Bible, one from secular wisdom. Uh, in Holy Scripture, we have examples throughout the New Testament of St. Paul essentially tearing his hair out, mm -hmm. hair out right, as he comes across uh, congregations, notably the Corinthians and the Galatians, who have complicated the message. Right. The message is very simple. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He has given himself for you. He has given himself to you. By that gift of Jesus, you are righteous. And then in the case of the Galatians, mm -hmm. uh, some people had come from the Jerusalem church and said, that's really good, but you also have to live according to all the commandments of the Old Testament law. Paul says, no, you don't. Christ had, in Christ, there's this new creation. That's language from Corinthians, actually. But uh, in Galatians, Christ has become a curse in order to redeem us from the curse that comes from, from viewing ourselves beneath the law of the Old Testament. In the book of Corinthians, uh, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, the situation is, is a little different. There, people were not at all concerned about right. following the Old Testament, right? right? They're, they were saying... Uh, boy, we're free in Christ. Eat, drink, and be merry. Eat, drink, and be merry to such excess yeah. that we are now transgressing the natural law at work in creation uh, that by, by which we still live because we recognize the creation to be a good gift of God. Uh, and so Paul had to say, uh, Jesus 
indeed has given himself to you. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Therefore, here's how we live in communion with this Jesus mm -hmm. who has really fulfilled the work of God in creation. You, you pointed out a, a really, I think, important relationship, the way that we all think of how we engage with God through the church, Pastor, and, and you use that language um, that makes sense to kids, mm -hmm. but it might not make sense to adults who have lived in this world. Oh, that's you said, interesting. You said, because right, Christ has set you free, mm -hmm. because he has baptized you and brought you into this body um, and, and preached to you of your own salvation, therefore, describe that relationship that the church is given to preach to its people in contrast with what we usually hear. There's another kind of relationship mm. that we usually hear, right? Sure. So what we usually hear, or what we might hear, some here, here and there, is a message that goes something like this. Uh, if you behave in this way, then therefore you are uh, part of the inside group, right? Yep. If you do this, then you get in. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot, of, a lot of people think that's how the church works. If you do this, then you get in. When in fact the church is saying the opposite message, uh, Christ has come outside. Mm. He has come so outside the box. He's come out of heaven. Yeah. He is reached by his death into the whole world. And uh, therefore, uh, the Lord declares, and, and you know, we declare to you, uh, you're in for the sake of the blood of Christ as a free and radical gift. In order to keep that message simple, then this comes to the, the, the secular piece of wisdom that it made me think of, was when people say uh, to businesses or to organizations, what's the thing you do well? Do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does the church do well? What would you say? What does the church do well? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, the church it, tries to do a lot of different things. It right? does now, especially. Uh, I think that throughout its history, uh, its couple thousand year history, the church has always done a couple of things. Well, first, worship. That is where the life of the church, you know, is in its purest essence because it's gathered around Jesus. It's people gathered around Jesus. Uh, and then it's carrying that life to others of that body that couldn't be there. So um, I'm thinking worship. I'm thinking home visitation, you know, mm. um, oh. even even in the beginning where they would take the offerings and bring them out to others in the community, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm really thinking about care uh, apart from, not, not apart from, but flowing from worship, the care for those in that Christian community yeah. uh, and the communication with those outside as well. Sure. So, because what's at the heart of worship is Word in Sacrament, there's a passage we were thinking about before going live here from 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, in which, starting at verse 4, we read the following, uh, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So why have we been called out of darkness into his marvelous light? Yeah, it is so that we may... Uh, proclaim proclaim the the marvelous wonders of what God has done mm -hmm. and so this is why worship is at the center this is why the worship why worship is what the church does well as yep. you put it mm -hmm. because if the church exists to receive Jesus and to be given back to him where do we receive him in the proclamation of his word where are we given back to him 
by faith in that word, the faith that that, that word creates. And then everything else flows from that. We ask the question, who is not yet receiving Jesus? Uh, who is not in touch with his word? And that's when we come into, the, into what you mentioned, care, uh, sending the gifts out to the homebound, for example, and then also outreach, um, connect, finding ways to uh, share the gospel and give the gifts to those who either have not heard or who have heard but who have not yet believed. And so worship, or we say liturgy, uh, outreach, care, or mercy. And then in order for all that to really take off, we talk about learning because in order to receive, if we're receiving Jesus through the word, then that implies that we're listening. That implies a process by which we're understanding. That implies that there will be learning that goes along with this. So um, liturgy, learning, care or mercy and outreach, basic functions and, and tasks of the church. Mm -hmm. Anything else we need to add to that or, or anything we need to unpack there? Well, there's always a lot to unpack when it comes to, to worship in, in specific, I think. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I think we've, in, in, the, in the Protestant world, we've had such different experiences. And even in the Lutheran world, we have different experiences in going to different Lutheran churches and participating mm -hmm. in that worship. Uh, what that worship, we know it's every time we step into a church that something is being said to us, right? Uh, and, and so what message are you receiving from a church that has all of these long practices, you know, long held practices oh, mm -hmm. uh, that consistently are giving you the gifts of Jesus and there's just more and more and more? Or, you know, a church where it's, a social gathering, a nice concert maybe, uh, some fun singing, and then you're out the door. Uh, you know, I think mm. I think that that's a, that's a particularly interesting thing to unpack is in worship, you know, how is that relationship being lived? Or, so that's, you know, that, that really focuses on maybe the Sunday morning experience, sure. right? And then a congregation, usually congregations develop a life around Sunday morning Hopefully it's flowing from Sunday morning and back to Sunday morning. That's why we talk about, again, learning so that we understand the gifts better. Care, to share the gifts with those who can't receive. Um, and outreach, to reach out to, to connect with those who have, who have not yet received and maybe are not yet interested in doing so. So that they may receive this gift of Jesus that makes the church uh, splendid, that makes the church full of splendor. Uh, there are we've talked in the past the past couple of weeks over of some ways that this gets off kilter whenever the church gets co-opted by a political uh, agenda mm. whenever the church gets uh, co-opted by social agenda even family agendas uh, when the church uh, becomes inward focused so inward focused that we're thinking about our relationships and how we're relating to each other in the congregation and not on how we're relating to Jesus Christ, how he's relating to us, how we're relating to other people uh, in order to share Jesus Christ with them. Um, so, so uh, you know, that's one of the, the, main, the main issues in church life today is always to keep that, to keep the main thing the main thing, as I think we have said before. So what could the church look like? You know, let's say that, um, I mean, let's just imagine for a moment that uh, a group of us have moved uh, for whatever reason to some wild place uh, that where there's not yet a church. And we're Christian, we're Lutherans, and we're going to start a new congregation. Uh, what might that look like? What would you, what would, how would you establish... If you, Pastor Pinzel, were given the task of establishing the weekly life of a church, mm -hmm. the daily, weekly, yearly life of a congregation in a new setting, one that would then serve its community, serve, its, serve the believers, also reach out beyond the believers to others, how would you establish a church? What would it look like? 
Well, the, obviously, the first thing and the, the thing that the missionaries uh, throughout time have proved to be very successful is you proclaim the good news, as as Peter would say. You proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness. So you have to first, you know, tell them with certainty, as Peter does here, you know, of who they are in Christ Jesus. That Jesus has called all creation to Himself and wants all mankind to be baptized into his body right so beginning with that and then unpacking it further and further with worship oh so this jesus is very interesting to you uh what excellencies pray tell does he provide well so we engage into the splendor of the church through worship um you know to begin with it's it's really it's not to give people in worship a little taste is to give them the real McCoys, give no. them the, the whole thing, you know, yeah. straight no chaser. You want to give them Jesus because without that, without what Peter is saying to his people here, then I think that the message lies on shaky ground, right? Peter in the scripture lesson calls them a royal priesthood. Now, I'm sure a lot of individuals who have been in the church for a long time, even not even those who have just been exposed to this, would say, what? Royal priesthood? Us? Peter's pretty sure of it, isn't he? Mm. There's mm. certainty. Mm. It's to consist consistently convey that certainty to the people in worship, and that's by giving them more and more and more of Scripture. And Scripture is, of course, the pouring out of God's gifts to the people. And then to make sure that that worship is going on daily, not just on Sundays. This is the life of the church. You know, it's to daily receive these gifts that Jesus offers himself. And then through those gifts, you know, provides us a life and also that certainty that indeed we are his. We are forgiven. We are given for a life that is bound to him. And it's a life of salvation. And so to consistently, you know, go through worship throughout the week and with worship, of course, catechize to, no. uh, to make sure that in worship you're also teaching as well. Mm. Yeah, right. Right. So, I mean, if the church lives through the self-giving of Jesus, it would make sense that the church would every day uh, be about the business of sharing and giving Jesus the mm. way he has promised mm. To be shared and given. That's a better way to put it. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Because how else can the church, how, the church can't live without the self-giving of Jesus. And so what else should the church be doing every day but giving Jesus? And so this is why we read the passage last week from second or from Acts chapter 2. And day by day they were breaking bread, right? Mm -hmm. Day by day they were listening to the apostles' teaching. They were praying they were breaking bread. In other words, day by day, they were preaching and having the Holy Supper. They were having the Holy Fellowship of the Christian Church every day. Now, picture today's modern church. Uh, a large brick structure, perhaps. Uh, nice education wing, fully outfitted. I'm thinking about suburban, rural church. I mean, there's also, in America, I mean, there's a, it's different. It's different in rural communities, but even there, right, you have, often in a rural community, you have the original structure. What was, the, this, this, I remember this amazing me at my first call, my first congregation in rural Marathon County. Uh, we were looking at the history, and everyone said, oh, I wish it was the way it used to be. I wish it was the way it, it used to be, right, because the way it used to be was always hundreds of people, and now churches often struggle to have a hundred people. Um, and so it was interesting, though, to look at the historical pictures and to watch that and, and see that as the building became bigger, the congregation got smaller. Think about that. Mm -hmm. So the original structure was simply a structure for one purpose, and that was worship. And then we add on the fellowship. We add on the education. We have these little wings, and you know, you add on narthex to make it more comfortable to get inside during the... Uh, winter, the winter season, and then that becomes a place where people gather and stand around and talk a lot before and after worship. You have the educational wing, places for people to learn. That's all good. I'm not saying that's bad. And there's lots of other reasons why churches have gotten smaller over time. But it's interesting 
that as our interests broadened, the congregation shrunk. <laughs> and maybe what every church should do in order to keep things simple is just be a place where there is word and sacrament every day, mm. where we are every day preach, every day have Holy Communion. Yeah. Here at Zion, we have begun having Holy Communion daily. We have begun doing that partly because of the, the novel coronavirus, the COVID-19. Uh, by having it daily, that gives people an option to come in a small group setting to receive the gifts of God. And that's been a blessing not just to our congregation, but also to people in the community. That's at 12.15, Monday through Friday, in case you're interested. But, um, but, but, but it's not just for the sake of convenience either, right? If the church is the body of Christ, if the church is splendid because of the self-giving of Christ, well, then let's give Christ. This is something that I often think people engaged in church growth don't stop to consider. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church, you know, they have had Holy Communion daily for hundreds of years. Uh, who's the largest church? Why are they? Uh, now, I'm not saying that we should be Roman Catholic. Lutherans have deep and abiding disagreements with the Roman Catholic faith. And they're important disagreements. They're apostolic, prophetic, scriptural disagreements. Uh, but we look at the early church, we see that they're gathering day by day for the apostles' teaching. Well, that means preaching uh, for the fellowship and the breaking of the bread. That gives Jesus. How else is a church supposed to live? Okay? We can try to become attractive in so many other ways. Yeah, and, and other ways that the church has is by labeling things that have now become commonplace in churches. Things like fellowship, right? Things like uh, Bible study, Sunday school. Important I, stuff. Very important stuff. So important that it, in fact, is included in every worship service. Oh. Tell me more about that. How is Sunday school fellowship, and what's the other thing you said, Bible study, how is that included in every single service? Well, I mean, if we go back to Acts, uh, the passage that you read, read last week, you know, you gather with the brothers or, or the people of faith, you know, the people that are all baptized into that body. Uh, and you, you gather together in even a more intimate sense than just coffee or food uh, that's just casual eating and drinking. You gather uh, around the body of your Lord and then you listen to his word and you pray with and for each other. I mean, it's very intimate. Oh, yeah. It's a very intimate connection. Uh, that's so that's, that's, yeah. a, that's a great kind of fellowship that can take place in worship, right? Um, also, if we think about Bible study, you know, we usually have different times where we can sit down and, and come together. So there's fellowship also in Bible study, right? And that's a beautiful thing about Bible study. We love Bible study here. And that's why we are often on Facebook. That's why right? we're doing this. That's why we're doing this. Um, but, you know, what, what part of that can't be done through the reading uh, and teaching, reading about the teachings of the apostles, as we are doing now, as would be done from the pulpit, right? And during the time where the readings are read. And, and then unpacking it through a sermon or a, a short homily. Those kinds of things can be done in worship. Also with Sunday school, you know, we, we want to make sure that we know that church as it is, is not just for one, you know, age group, one right. population. One generation. Mm -hmm. And, and St. Paul certainly didn't have another Bible that he gave children. This was for everybody, right? And it was also for the parents to instruct their children in. Right, right. So the service well, is meant for, yeah. for everyone. Yeah, so that brings up another issue. Um, so I'm putting an issue up there. Don't let me forget, I just put an issue up on the shelf. But one difference, I suppose, would be, one, one first thing to say is one difference between worship and, say, a Bible study is there's room for question and answer sure. in a Bible study. Yeah. I, now, I know of one preacher who ends every sermon by saying, are there any questions? <laughs> That's kind of interesting. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not adverse to that. I mean, I kind of like that. <laughs> now, he's in a smaller church. It's a little bit easier in a smaller church. In a larger church... People don't always wouldn't always feel comfortable doing that sort of thing, right? Or if you have a radio broadcast, I mean that that makes that all very difficult to do that kind of thing. Um, but but still, uh, there's something to that. 
and Bible study in that sense, then we can see Bible study as an extension of worship. In a way, Bible study, yeah. when we gather in a small group for Bible study, what we're doing is we're saying, here is an opportunity to explore further what you've heard already in worship. Now, one issue that you just brought up for me in my mind is the extent to which sometimes churches these days are taking over the task of the home. Sure. That part of the, you know, when we say the church, we, we went over what the church is, according to the Augsburg Confession, very carefully. And this is what we find in Holy Scripture as well. The church is the gathering of believers around word and sacrament. So that means the church is uh, wherever two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, ultimately. And so in the home, uh, the church is at work as what people of one household, whomever they may be, housemates, apartment mates, family, uh, gather around to hear the word of God together. Uh, and sometimes the catechism, the teaching, the question and answer can work best there. If not because of the direct knowledge of the people involved, then because they have good books that they can consult. Mm -hmm. I mean, books are a simple technology. Books are like the original internet in a way because books made information portable. Books made it possible to, to, for, for information to cover ground from one place to another and not only be shared in the hearing, in the direct personal hearing of someone. We can almost think of uh, Luther's small catechism as you know the list of most commonly asked Google search questions about the faith. Right? Oh, yeah, there what you go. What, what is this? Yeah, that's nice. And, and of yeah. course, uh, if, if you don't know the story, Martin Luther developed a small catechism basically on experience in his own household mm -hmm. and teaching his son, his, his little son. Was it Hansi? Uh, I can't remember if it was Hansi or, what, or his daughter. It was one of them. They would always ask Luther, Dada, was ist das? Was know? ist das? Yeah. Was ist das? Like, like a kid would. What is yeah. this? Yeah. What is this? And uh, that's how the rhythm of the catechism goes. Also, uh, some of the first small catechisms were actually posters. Mm -hmm. Posters designed to be put in um, kitchens or in dining areas so that they could be taught around a table. And it's, it's also included still in the small catechism as well. It is. And so that question that Pastor Pinzel just mentioned, what is this? That's repeated throughout the old, throughout the small catechism. It's translated usually, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. But in the original German, it's just, was ist das? What is that? What is this thing? Uh, and so he gets done with a piece of, say, the, the Apostles' Creed or um, a, a ten command, one of the Ten Commandments, you shall honor your father and mother. And then the next question is, well, what is this thing? And then he explains what this thing is, what this commandment is, and what it's telling us. It's a beautiful little way of learning. That can happen in the home, mm -hmm. and uh, probably will need to be happening more in the home, especially in the short term, as churches find it more difficult to gather for whatever reason, um, either because we need to not gather or because people don't feel comfortable gathering. Uh, the church is going to be thinking of all different ways to do that. But still, that, that takes us back to the question of what does a church look like day to day? Yeah. So day to day, the church is about the task of proclaiming the word of God, either by all of its members in their homes and workplaces, or by the public ministry, the ministers, the pastors in the congregation. The Holy Supper is part of the public ministry. It's always been celebrated that way. Um, with the whole, you know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, wait for the whole church to gather and only then proceed with the Holy Supper. And so it's a public celebration, a public gathering, but teaching that can, that can happen in the home yeah. and frequently does happen in the home. So this is why, as we're looking at our schedule here at Zion, we're saying to ourselves, yes, it's it's been a matter of... Um, urgency and emergency perhaps to begin having daily communion so as to provide it in a small group setting uh, where people can uh, be or feel safer but also why not continue that because that is the life of the church let's just give jesus daily mm -hmm. well pastor no one's going to come well that's doesn't sound like jesus problem right <laughs> that's uh that that's that's our that's us, and and so uh, we give and we give Jesus according to His command, 
And of course, we understand schedules and everybody can always call me. I mean, that's not the point. But is the point the point is to make to to in obedience to Jesus to make available publicly that which he would have given to the public ultimately. And of course, it's given in a certain way. I mean, the Holy Supper is given to those who are baptized and who are coming for the body and blood of Christ. Um, but but that public proclamation, that public ministry is essential to the life of the church. So let's just be about the task of being the church now. Now that we are questioning how we are doing everything, businesses are undertaking new ways of being a business. There, I just heard about, where was that? Was it in Iowa, I think? I'm not sure where it was, but there is one restaurant. Yeah, it was in Iowa. I saw on the news today. Maybe some of you others uh, saw this as well. There was a restaurant that was uh, uh, in in fear of, of closing during the shutdown. It was in Iowa where their shutdown looked different than other states, but they're in fear of closing. Uh, and so they thought, well, let's instead of being a restaurant, let's be a nonprofit. And they started giving away their food for free in response to donations. And as a result of doing that, that allowed them to, uh, you know, get around some some legal stuff and stay open in a way that they weren't going to be able to otherwise, from what I understood from the news report. But amazingly enough, it also gave them a new lease on life as a restaurant. All of a sudden, people responded to that in a way they had never responded to them as a restaurant. Mm. And these donations were overflowing and, and free food was being given out. And it, you know, it's, it's now they've come into a new way of being who they are. That's kind of been happening for the church as well. And so how, how can we be more the church, I guess, is the question. I think also, you know, going back to the, the um, relationship that was described before, the difference between the if you do this, then you get that relationship, or, or the one that you hear in the church, which is the because of Jesus, therefore, you are made righteous, holy, uh, and, and given his eternal life. Uh, I, I think, you know, when we continue to be about the business of mm -hmm. what Jesus gave the church for, which is really proclaiming him as Christ and Lord, right? It's, this is this is the confession of Peter. Um, then you're always going to be able to fit nicely into that gospel-centered relationship that because of Jesus, therefore. Mm -hmm. you, you know, when, when the church gets involved in all these other things and people can experience the churches. Well, you have to do this or else, right? You have to be a part of this group or else, or you have to participate in this way or else. Uh, you know, how inclusive is it to simply say, you know, this is this is what the church does, um, because Jesus is it lives to offer you all the gifts of Jesus. Come and see, receive them, hear about them, give them to your children as well, because they like it, uh, and and live in that way. You know, that's a very uh, inclusive message right. rather than putting up a guard and saying well if you have to do this yeah first. yeah yeah right yeah good point good point so imagine a, uh, so we're talking about both the public ministry and the private life or the daily life uh, of the church and its members so imagine a church where you can always depend on the public ministry daily to be handing out word and sacrament in some way that only makes so much sense and now imagine uh, a church in which its members are in their homes and workplaces every day in some way sharing the word of God. Since it is by the word of God that faith is created, as we read in Romans chapter 10, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the message of Christ. Let's just live in that faith and see what happens. Uh, let's not try to be too clever. Let's not try to be too smart. Let's not try to be smarter than Jesus in how to build a church. We ought not think of ourselves more highly. Than we ought. Yeah. Right. Exactly right. Um, so um, let me just reread that passage from Acts 2. We've referenced it so many times. It's, we should reread it so it's actually in your head. Um, I also let's see if we have some, some comments here. Um, all right. And so, so just some comments of appreciation. Uh, as uh, people, um, you know, one person comments uh, that they appreciate that, you know, this is, you know, there's so many other distractions, but this, 
this will be here and available. And that's just it. I, I really have grown in my appreciation for online ministry. I know that there's criticisms of online ministry and there are limits to online ministry, but so are there limits to in-person ministry. Yeah. Right? Yeah, online ministry, like I said, online ministry is like a book. Uh, the purpose of a book was to carry a message across the miles and take it with you. Online ministry is essentially doing the same thing, so we can create a community of faith. Imagine a church, well, it's like what we're doing here, where every day you can anticipate that, that the public ministry would be assisting you in marking the morning, marking the evening, and giving supper at, at some point mm -hmm. in the day. I mean, that's a beautiful rhythm of, of ministry, I, I think, because it's it's... Sharing the word of God in the morning, as we see in the scriptures. Sharing the God in the evening, as we see done in the scriptures. It's sharing the Holy Supper. We've chosen midday, the hour in which Christ was crucified, uh, in which he gives himself to us on the cross, uh, in the same way he's giving to himself to us in the Holy Supper. Um, anyway, the reading from Acts chapter 2. So thank you for those comments. And if you have questions or anything, you know, by all means, put them in the comments, and we'll try to uh, respond to those. Acts chapter 2. Verse 42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. There's two other things mentioned there then that flow from the self-giving of Jesus in word and sacrament. And these, this is part of us being given back to Jesus. Those two things are, they held their possessions in common. Mm -hmm. so, that, so care of the poor is part of the church's yes. life as well. Yep. And then they gave thanks for their food in their homes. In addition to the Holy Supper, they're giving thanks. And so mealtime in the home becomes a central way of conveying the word of God and marking life with the word of God. And so uh, that then becomes also part of the rhythm of the church. But imagine how simple that can be. I mean, it seems pretty simple there. They, they turn their money in and the money gets given back out. Yeah. I mean, most churches, Zion included, has a help fund um, for that purpose, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and there's a way that we administer that. Uh, so that it's it seems equitable and just and is not wasted, um, and it's but pure it, joy. But it's also pure joy, and it's yeah. handed out, you know, to those to those who need. And then to teach people more and more, value the table in your home, make carve out space for that table, make time for that table, gather around the table to receive the word of God along with food says something about the word of God. So that's something about the food yeah, for sure. yeah. that's from God, but it also says something about the Word of God that it also is food. That you do not live by simple bread alone. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. What time is it, Pastor? Oh, it's 9.39. Okay, so about five more minutes. I'm going to have Pastor Pinzel read a passage here from the Augsburg Confession uh, in which the, Lutheran, the Lutherans of 1530, so about uh, almost 500 years ago, 490 years ago, uh, describe how they celebrate communion and, and whether or not they're going to continue celebrating communion. And this is important, again, because I think that presence of Jesus is so essential to the life of the church. If we are the body of Christ, then we are what we eat. And so what do the Lutherans have to say about that? This is chap uh, not chapter, but article 24. It's entitled Concerning the Mass. Uh, a term that Lutherans have never rejected for mm. Holy Communion. Important. Uh, yeah, just, it's just a shorthand term, so that's the language it uses maybe, here. Maybe important to just uh, let the people know what the uh, word Mass actually means, why we don't reject it, perhaps. It's a very simple reason, actually. Why don't you share that? Why don't you share that? Let me to share Okay, <laughs> so uh, Mass, the word Mass, the, 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 actually the etymology of the word Mass is debated. There are two possible reasons why it is used. Um, it's either a form of the word mesa, which or mens, mensa mesa, uh, which uh, is the word for table. So we gather for table, for mesa, for mass. I tend to think that's where it came from, that it simply means table. And that's where 
my mind goes to. Right. Uh, now, there's another theory out there that some believe is more likely, which is that um, the mass ended when the pastor said, uh, Ita Misa, I believe, right? Which means it's over. Mm -hmm. And, um, or, or was it, you can, or there's another one, I think that's where it was, Ita Misa. And then the idea was you hadn't had mass until the priest said, Ita Misa, it is over. And so you had to stay through those words for it to count. And therefore, you know, the way, way we mess these things up. Yep. And therefore, um, it got called the Missa, the Mass. Because um, you, you had to wait for those words for it to count. I don't know. I, uh, I, I, I think the etymology with... I, I tend to think that way. I don't know. I mean, there are people who are smarter than I on that subject, but that's where those two terms we can take it, from. And you know, we can run with the evangelical meaning, which is... Table. Table. Yeah. I mean, Lutherans in like Scandinavia, they still use the word mass. It's not a big deal. Yeah. In America, it became more of a big deal. But what does is, what is Article 24 say in the Augsburg Confession? Our people have been unjustly accused of having abolished the mass. But it is obvious without boasting that the mass is celebrated among us with greater devotion and earnestness than among our opponents. The people are instructed more regularly and with the greatest diligence concerning the Holy Sacrament to what purpose it was instituted and how it is to be used, namely, as a comfort to terrified consciences. So how is Holy Communion to be used? Is to be used as a comfort to terrified consciences. The Lutherans at that time were accused of having abolished the Mass. The reason they were accused of that is because Lutherans were teaching that the Mass is not a sacrifice. And, and Roman Catholics, or you know, the Ro they weren't called Roman Catholics at that time, but just the Roman Church, uh, Lutherans, you know, just as the Roman Church called Lutherans Lutherans as kind of a slur, uh, Lutherans called the Roman Church Papists as kind of a slur. You follow Luther, you follow the Pope. Uh, it's a sad time, but anyway, uh, the Roman Church was saying, "Well, if you've gotten rid of the mat of the sacrifice, then it is no longer uh, the mass." And Lutheran said, "Oh no, it is the mass, and it's the mass even more diligently than it was before, because we are now teaching people actively what it is, the holy body and blood of Jesus, why it's given for the comfort of terrified consciences. And so the mass is not given for you to rack up points that will get you up into heaven." Rather, the Mass is given as a comfort to you already now, assuring you, here's Jesus. And part of that, part of the, the important transition that was made is when Luther, um, you know, converted the, the Latin Mass into the Deutsche Mass, or the language of the people, the German Mass, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think what's really important there, establishing the meaning around the word Mass and table, is that then the people could hear, hoc est corpus meum, what does this mean? This is my body. Right? I mean, so much has been, uh, you know, developed, ironically, off of the misunderstanding of hoc est corpus meum. Right. right? We, we hocus talk about, pocus. Yeah, hocus pocus. We talked about that the other day. It's, it's a funny kind of way where the people in their own vernacular, the common folk, just didn't, they didn't understand the Latin there. They were just, they knew that they should go. Uh, they knew that, you know, they should receive these gifts and these things uh, in order to then secure themselves. But what... The Lutherans were teaching is it is secure because of this guy who says this is my body. He's putting it into your mouth, right? And it's now living in your body, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so they, I mean, imagine that never hearing those words before, but always doing this as a kid, never really understanding mm -hmm. Latin or that language, and then all of a sudden having it open up to you in your own tongue. And that's incredible. That would be an incredible experience. I once listened to a sermon actually by a priest in the Roman church who said that the, he grew up with the Latin mass. He was ordained with the Latin mass. He did the Latin mass for the first several years of his ministry. And then when Vatican II came and they were ordered to now say the mass in English, he said hearing those words in English shattered his faith mm. for a time. Mm because he had so grown accustomed to the supper being something so radically otherworldly 
so radically almost inaccessible that that's what using that latin communicated to him that the supper was distant yeah. it was it was almost untouchable it was so holy and then to hear it put in such common language he said shattered his faith for a time um and then and then you know it he, he was brought through that uh to a deeper better appreciation of the holy supper that's exactly right because when it's proclaimed in our language then it emphasizes even more this is given and shed for you, you. for the forgiveness of sins and it's in the particular it's for you as an individual and it's saying so in your own tongue now we can speak in latin too and we do not um you know remove the latin oh right case. we love we'll, right. we'll uplift that as much as possible as part of the tradition of the church and it's beautiful because it sounds so different the church can still use latin because it really does make the church seem like an otherworldly place which is what it's proclaiming in another world has invaded this world breaking into this yeah. world and it's a way of gathering up culture uh, you know the church gathers up languages wherever it goes and so in a typical service you'll hear latin for sure yeah. alleluia is mm -hmm. a latin word it's, an, it's a latin transliteration i would say of the hebrew hallelujah uh carrie you'll yeah. often hear that's greek uh, that's greek lord uh amen it's hebrew and so you'll hear those, you know, those in those little ways, you'll hear that language. But then sometimes we'll sing whole uh, songs in different languages in, you know, there's Swahili hymns in some of our hymn books and Spanish hymns. Um, and some of that language and architecture all gets gathered up into the church's worship life. But the splendor of the church is ultimately wrapped up in those words from Jesus recorded in the Gospels given shed for you for the forgiveness of sins what's given and shed for you jesus jesus who became body and blood he is given he is shed for you for your forgiveness that's the splendor of the church and so therefore uh that's got to be the life of the church every and, day and he wants you to be comfortable with that life mm -hmm. that's why he keeps giving it mm -hmm. right it, it should be a normal thing for you a, a beautiful and divine thing that you receive daily he wants you to get comfortable and your kids to get comfortable with his life this life that he provides that's why you know the augsburg confession is so right in saying it's given for the comfort of consciences to know who you are that's a really really good thing to have certainty in who you are you know even when you fall daily mm. and and you don't really know like am i am i really am i really good mm. you know and and to hear someone like peter say you're a royal priesthood in the name of Jesus. Mm. And that's certain. Mm. I mean, that's, that's powerful stuff. That is. That is. Well, shall we pray? Pastor, would you pray for us to close out our session here today? Surely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O most gracious Lord, you indeed are bountiful in providing your gifts to your people. And so let us receive them in good faith, receiving your word as a child does any good things. And so holding it fast to you, clinging to your forgiveness, lifting up your life, and getting used to your word of salvation. Grant that all your people might be drawn together into this good news that your Lord is given here on this earth to offer. And may we all sing it together in glory on that last day when he comes again. In your heavenly and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today, and be sure to join us next week also Tuesdays at 9 a.m. for Table Talk. God's peace be with you.